Hey, podcast listeners, this is Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's episode is one that my colleagues have been hammering away at me to make for months. It goes into the part of our ideas that uh, we find is most often misunderstood. Without the ideas in this episode, uh, just so much of what we say and the advice that we give is going to make a little sense to you. As far as I know, outside of uh, published academic papers, this is now the most detailed uh, discussion of the attitudes that effective altruists tend to have towards uh, thinking about the long term. It presents a pretty complex perspective on history and how we can affect it that is pretty hard, in fact, to, to summarize briefly. And we also work through a bunch of the common objections that people instinctively have. The general idea is that effects on future generations are extremely important and probably the main thing that we should be focused on and thinking about if we're trying to improve the world as much as possible. We also go through the justifications for this and the implications that it would have across population ethics, uh, economics and government. In the show notes, I've linked to a YouTube video where I go and expand on one of the aspects of the discussion, which is how we can actually try to predict the long-term consequences of our actions. If you're motivated to work on improving the long-term prospects for humanity after listening to the show uh, by helping to solve the kinds of problems that we discuss, then there's a link in the show notes uh, or the blog post about the episode, which you can use to apply for personalized coaching from us. Rather than uh, sitting in front of your computer for two hours listening to this, I strongly recommend that you uh, subscribe to the show on whatever podcasting app you use by searching for 80,000 hours. Uh, that way you can also speed up the conversation if you're able to think faster than we're able to talk. Finally, if you enjoy the show, please do share it on Facebook or let your friends know about it so that uh, they can subscribe. And now I bring you Toby Ord. Today I'm speaking with Toby Ord. Toby is a moral philosopher at Oxford University. His work focuses on the big picture questions facing humanity, like what are the most important issues of our time and how can we best address them? Toby's earlier work explored the ethics of global health and global poverty, and this led him to create an international society called Giving What We Can, whose members have pledged over $1.4 billion to the most effective charities helping to improve the world. He also co-founded the wider effective altruism movement, of which 80,000 Hours is a part, encouraging thousands of people to use reason and evidence to help others as much as possible. Toby has advised the World Health Organization, the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, the US National Intelligence Council, the UK Prime Minister's Office, the Cabinet Office, and the Government Office for Science. Uh, and his work has been featured more than 100 times in the national and international media. I should add that Toby is a trustee of the charity that I work at, 80,000 Hours, but uh, any sycophancy here is entirely sincere, I assure you. His current research is on avoiding the threat of human extinction and thus safeguarding a positive future for humanity. So thanks for coming on the podcast, Toby. Oh, thank you, Rob. It's great to be here. <laughs> uh, you're actually working on a book about uh, preserving the future of humanity at the moment, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, I, th I think it's a one of the most important topics of our time. And I'm, uh, it's something that I've worked on for quite a few years now at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford. Uh, and we realized that it, it's really missing a book uh, to really tell the story. So maybe just, just lay out the, the broad arguments that you're making in, in, in the book. Why is the long-term future of humanity such a big deal and, and perhaps the, the, the most important issue for us to be thinking about? Okay, uh, allow me to uh, start uh, by uh, recapping uh, human history so far. I think that's a good way of uh, letting us see, see where we've got to. Uh, so about 200,000 years ago, uh, we had the rise of uh, humanity, uh, our species, Homo sapiens. Uh, we're not that remarkable on our own, uh, but we had uh, enough ability to learn uh, and to share knowledge uh, with a few other uh, humans and small groups uh, and to cooperate with them. And this led to the slow but steady accumulation of knowledge over time. Now, if you jump forward uh, about 190,000 years uh, ahead, 95% uh, of the way to the present, uh, there was a very major transition, which was the agricultural revolution. Uh, by uh, moving from foraging uh, to farming, uh, we were able to get enough food uh, to have enough people in one place uh, that we could develop cities and writing and these two technologies uh, let us have enough people in one location, uh, in the order of a million people, uh, to enable specialization uh, and cooperation on a grand scale. 
uh, and writing enabled us uh, to share the information much better between generations. And so then the number of people cooperating, instead of being about 100 people, uh, was millions of people over uh, dozens of generations. Uh, and this really uh, meant that we had civilization and things really took off uh, with mathematics and law and money and metalworking and uh, lots of other things. Uh, so then if we go forward quite a long way again, I think another big breakthrough was the scientific revolution. Uh, and this was a huge change in our ability to understand the world. Uh, this led to a massive rise in technology, uh, which continues to this day. Uh, and also to this idea of revolutionary progress, where people were aware that within their own lifetime, uh, the very foundations of how the world work uh, may change dramatically. Uh, another 100 years later, uh, so 300 years ago, uh, this uh, blossomed into the Enlightenment, which was when we tried applying these uh, ideas of reason and evidence uh, to the social and political world, uh, as well as to uh, the natural world. And this led to these massive improvements in political systems. Uh, and great improvements in the, uh, the well-being of people uh, who were under these more liberal systems. Then about 200 years ago, uh, we had the Industrial Revolution, uh, where what we did was we used coal, uh, which enabled us to capture the, uh, the power of millions of years of condensed sunlight, uh, leading to a huge increase in our energy supply uh, and obviously to automation. Uh, and this gave us a huge increase in income that, for the first time in human history, outstripped population growth. Uh, so we grew richer uh, per capita. Uh, and for the first time in history, this meant that prosperity spread beyond a small elite. Okay, so that's uh, a lot of things that, that we will have read about in the history books. Uh, but I think also that there's an era of human history uh, that's even more important than any of these famous uh, transitions. And that is something that started about 70 years ago. Uh, and I think the key to that uh, was that this increasing power uh, created by uh, cities and uh, the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution, uh, this massive increase in technolo technological power uh, meant that we finally were so capable uh, that we had the ability to wield destructive forces that could destroy humanity itself. Uh, this came with the rise of nuclear weapons in the 20th century, uh, and it continues now uh, in the 21st century uh, that we're having the rise of synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, uh, maybe nanotechnology, creating uh, ever newer technologies which could cause threats to humanity itself. And this is a time where, unless we get our act together as a species, there's only so many of these centuries that we're going to be able to survive. This is precipitous rise in the risk that we're undergoing, uh, threatening this very threat of humanity itself. Uh, so we hopefully will see a whole lot more of these eras in the future and a whole lot of great additional improvements in the lot of humanity. Uh, but unless we get this time right, uh, then we're not going to see any of that at all. Uh, it'll be the end of our story. So there's a sense in which uh, things have gotten a lot better over the last few hundred years. Obviously, people are richer and they're living longer. But there's also a sense in which uh, humanity's situation has become more precarious because 200 years ago, there was no way that the stupid action of a single person could uh, drive humanity, humanity into the ground uh, really quickly. But today, just, you know, there's a few people who have the authority to launch nuclear weapons. And if they cause an all-out nuclear war, it would basically drive humanity back to the, to the Stone Age uh, very quickly within a, you know, within a day. Uh, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, and it might drive us even further than that. It might, uh, it might be the end of humanity itself. So we'll consider some philosophical and practical objections to thinking about the long-run future later on. But maybe you just want to lay out uh, you know, like how bad it could be if, if humanity went extinct. Like how much, how much could we potentially be, be losing? Sure. Uh, so I think that the key way to think about this is really in terms of how, how good it would be uh, to have the continued flourishing of humanity uh, and then in general to see it being bad by denying this, you know, denying that to us. So I think it is pretty intuitive uh, that... Uh, if there's really a substantial chance of humanity's future being extinguished, and that's something maybe we need to talk about later as to whether there really is, but granting that there is a substantial chance of the end of humanity this century or in the coming few centuries, uh, 
I think a lot of people would accept that that is probably one of the most pressing issues that we face. Um, I doubt that you would see, you know, um, key geopolitical figures, you know, Angela Merkel say, oh, you know, the fact there's 50% chance that humanity will be destroyed on during, you know, my uh, tenure in this job is uh, is kind of irrelevant because there'd be no one around, you know, for it to be bad for. Uh, I think that's, you know, helps to see how absurd that is. Uh, similarly, um, uh, when we think of a catastrophe killing thousands of people, uh, we, we see clearly that that's terrible. And it's even worse when it kills millions or billions of people. Uh, and also that generally that killing more people can't make it less bad. It's not that once it kills another billion people, it becomes good or okay. Um, uh, that's very implausible. Um, uh, and uh, so that, that's just a few points about the intuitiveness of this. Um, now, here are a few different arguments, though, as to where the value is uh, in preserving humanity. So one is, uh, I think, the, the strongest argument is that it's in the well-being of the future generations. Uh, all of the hopes and dreams uh, that they have in their lives, uh, the great experiences they have, uh, the things they do, um, that there's so much more of human history that may be yet to come. And if you think about this, uh, there have only been about 10,000 years of human civilization um, uh, the, this time period where we've had uh, these kinds of advances in art and culture and uh, so forth, and where our living, uh, our lifespans have gone up so much, and, and our quality of life and health is so high, um, violence has gone down, uh, and where we're free from illness. Uh, and so of that time, we've had about 10,000 years, uh, but uh, our species is 200,000 years old. Uh, and so of the 100 centuries we've had, uh, there's every reason to expect that we, if we don't cause our own extinction, that naturally we could live for another um, uh, 2,000 centuries or potentially much longer. Um, uh, the Earth looks like it will remain habitable. It's been uh, inhabited uh, for about uh, 3 billion years, uh, possibly longer, and it looks like it will remain habitable for another 500 million years to a billion years. Uh, so there may well be... Um, uh, potentially a billion years of human history to come, uh, which is vastly longer um, than what we've had so far. Uh, and if so, uh, or even if there was only a very small chance of that, really, or if it, even if it was only going to be as long as we've had so far, uh, there'd be so much more of it to come than we've had in civilization so far. Um, so that's one argument, that it's about all of these future people who could exist and all of the great lives they would have. Uh, but another argument, you might think that um, that mere happiness uh, isn't what matters. What matters are the great achievements that humanity reaches. Uh, and think about these kind of great moments of uh, art and culture uh, that we've had in the past. Uh, but again, there's every reason to think that if we've only had a small fraction so far of uh, the human civilization that we could have, that most of these great achievements are actually going to be in the future. We'll achieve even greater things than the you know, great works of music and art, the great works of science uh, that we've had so far. Uh, in the future. And then a, a third approach is to think uh, in terms of a partnership across the generations. Uh, there was a, a, a politician and political theorist, uh, Edmund Burke, had this, uh, this great uh, analogy of thinking about society as this partnership of, uh, across the generations, where the types of things that we do are too big for any generation to do on their own. Uh, but what we do with a with a country or with our, our global civilization is that we build up institutions and knowledge, um, and build up these norms in which to live by, and uh, and our art and culture. Uh, and each generation does their part, improves it, and hands this down to the next generation, who continues this grand project across the generations. And we could be the the first generation uh, to ruin that uh, and just to destroy this legacy which we've been handed down uh, and to have it go nowhere from here. Um, and uh, that's another angle on this, is a kind of deontological angle um, uh, in a way in which uh, failing to preserve humanity, and in particular actively destroying humanity, um, would make us pretty clearly the worst generation that had ever lived. Make us really uh, uncooperative jerks in this in the scheme of things. <laughs> Indeed, uh, and um, uh, and that so, so that's that's another argument uh, uh, for the for the importance of this, and also for the central importance as to why we would be at a pivotal, you know, among the most important times uh, to live and to have 
shirked this most important of all responsibilities. Uh, then another approach is to think about uh, virtue and uh, virtue ethics. Uh, so you could think of this here on the individual level, uh, that uh, trying to safeguard human civilization uh, shows a real imaginative compassion uh, or fairness, uh, questions about fairness between generations, um, showing this virtue, um, but also a certain kind of generalization of, uh, of love. Um, a really, if you think about the type of love uh, uh, that a parent has for their child, um, or the kind of uh, sometimes called procreative love of uh, bringing into existence this new uh, being uh, with and creating this wonderful life for them, uh, that that's one way you could think about this uh, yearning to create this great and glorious future ahead of us. Um, but I think actually in terms of virtue, uh, there's even stronger arguments if you think of what I call civilizational virtues. So if you think of uh, humanity itself or human civilization uh, as a group agent and you think about uh, what qualities would be its virtues, I think that if you if you look at it that way, um, you can see that we're really lacking in in wisdom at the moment. We have we have some, and we perhaps have more than we did um, a while ago. But it's growing much more slowly than our power. Uh, we've had this problem of having rapid increases in power, driven by this this amazing exponential increase in technology, which has out, outstripped our growth of wisdom and uh, and coordination. Uh, but we could instead try to really push for uh, more wisdom as a civilization. In particular, um, we could be less reckless um, and think about the virtue of prudence at the civilizational level. Uh, whereas we're in this situation, uh, I mean, if, if, if it really is the case that we could have a billion years of civilization uh, and that we risk that uh, for a century of uh, improving our own lot, uh, then that's equivalent to, at the kind of more human level time scale, risking your entire life um, because of what's happening in this minute of your life. Uh, and also the virtue of patience uh, is a similar aspect of thinking about this really long future that we could have and trying to uh, patiently uh, work out how to really achieve things over, our, over, the, over this stretch of time instead of being very impatient. And then finally, uh, people have suggested that Another reason uh, is about cosmic significance. So for all we know, we're alone in the universe uh, and the life here on Earth uh, may well be the only life. And even if it isn't, uh, the intelligent life in humanity um, quite possibly is the only uh, intelligent life in the universe. Uh, so it's, it's very possible uh, that we might uh, be the most amazing and rare part of the whole universe uh, the only part of the universe capable of understanding the universe itself and appreciating its wonders, uh, in which case it might be even more important uh, that we don't uh, squander this and destroy this one uh, most special part of, of all of creation. So we've got an argument there from the positive consequences that the future could have, uh, arguments about how uh, being foolhardy and taking enormous risks uh, with human civilization violates uh, the rules of decent conduct that, uh, you know, of, of how generations ought to treat one another. Uh, an argument from it being uh, a virtuous thing to do to, to think about the long-term consequences of your, of your actions and care about future generations and, and nurturing them. Uh, and then also perhaps a, a more spiritual argument in a way about the potential cosmic uh, significance of uh, complicated life and, and intelligence and not wanting to, to squander that without, you know, really having thought about whether it would be the, the right thing to do. That's right. And so I think some people who've, who've thought about this or questioned, questioned it, um, we're pretty much just thinking about this well-being of the future generations and may not have realized that there's actually kind of convergent re reasons um, for many of the different uh, traditions of ethical thinking, uh, which uh, converge to say that uh, um, the destruction of humanity would be one of the very worst things that could happen. Hmm. Another line of argument I've heard is just that even if you didn't care intrinsically about the welfare of future generations, 
Uh, the, the current generation does just care a lot that their actions today have a long-term meaning behind them. And, and you, can, you can think about this. Imagine that uh, you found out that everyone was going to die in the year 2040. Then just so much of the significance of life is, is completely stripped away because uh, an enormous amount of what we do is about trying to, to build up future generations and, and improve uh, the long term trajectory of civilization. And, and a lot of the research we're doing, you know, having children, building buildings, uh, trying to produce great works of art. If you know that it's all just going to come to an end in 20 or 30 years time, then uh, just kind of the, the, the whole point of life is, is much reduced. Yeah. And uh, uh, one can take that that even further if you think about this aspect that we're, we're currently in this very special time by human, the standards of human history uh, when our actions could destroy uh, our world, or at least it, it's very plausible that they could. We, could. we could come to some questions about nuclear winter and so on later. Um, but in this, this very special time, uh, not only is it the case that, that as you say, uh, there might be less meaning in our lives if we knew that, um, that humanity wasn't going to continue, uh, but I think there's additional meaning uh, to our time uh, and that ultimately uh, that this fills our time with particular meaning uh, that what we have to do is to stop this happening uh, and to navigate this period and get out the other side uh, to a world that has... Um, has really got its act together on these issues and is no longer at th the threat uh, that a single person's actions, say the uh, the president of the United States of America, uh, could launch a massive nuclear attack or something else, uh, which uh, which might lead to the uh, destruction of of everything that we value. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, let, you, you've pointed out that uh, basically from every mainstream philosophical position, it would be a, a tragedy, perhaps the greatest tragedy, if we drove ourselves extinct for, for, for no good reason. Um, maybe let's just dive in on the, the consequences argument uh, and, and look at the, the case that's sometimes made that uh, the long-term future is, is just overwhelming. Uh, so you've pointed out that the uh, even if humans just stayed with their present population on Earth for mm -hmm. you know thousands of years, then that would make uh, the, this issue of ensuring civilizational continuity very important. But but how how far can can you push the argument? Uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, the one way that I think about it is that a lot of the value uh, in, of the future uh, comes from. Uh, duration, uh, that the future uh, could be very much longer than the present, uh, just as the past has been very much longer than the, the present time or the present generation. Uh, and that gives a very large multiplier in terms of uh, how much good we could do uh, by helping to preserve that very long period of time. Uh, but there's also the aspect that uh, the scope might be very much larger, um, the scale. Uh, it might be that uh, instead of just one planet uh, that we've managed to spread to other planets and spread uh, perhaps through the 100 billion uh, stars of our galaxy uh, or even uh, through billions of galaxies uh, around us. Uh, so it could be that the type of thing that we're giving up is much more than uh, than uh, this pale blue dot uh, and and the civilization as we know it, uh, we might be giving up something much, much larger. Um, so these things suggest that, it, that, it, that the value could be much bigger than this. Uh, however, um, I think it's, it's tricky here. You've got to be careful with these conclusions. I think some of the early thought on this is, was a bit rash. Uh, so uh, Nick Beckstead actually clarifies a lot of this. He has a very good uh, PhD thesis on the topic. Uh, and one of uh, the points that he makes uh, is that is that th this argument about um, extinction and how bad it would be um, suggests that it's much worse uh, and it's much bigger deal than the very uh, immediate effects of other actions that we could take. Um, uh, so that's uh, that's the argument that's fairly clear. However, if we do something else, suppose we save an individual's life. Um, if we look at that just over a short period of time, it's much smaller uh, than saving the life of humanity itself. Uh, but it will have effects that go on for a long time as well. Um, a simple model of that could be that uh, that 
actually there's an extra person in every generation um, for all time, uh, or even uh, that uh, there's a seven billionth more people in every generation for all time. Um, that would have been a reasonable model so far with the exponential growth of human population. Uh, and then if you actually look at these long-term effects of, of other actions, they could have very big effects over the, the whole future. Um, and it's not actually that clear um, uh, which is bigger. Um, so the key there is to think that uh, that these aspects, which say the future may be a lot bigger, uh, apply to everything um, when you're thinking about the very long-term effects of your actions. And so what they really say is that if you are a long-termist and you, um, you don't uh, think that people matter different amounts just based on when they live, uh, then it follows that the long-term consequences of actions compared to the short-term consequences, the long-term consequences are much more important than you would have otherwise thought. Uh, and if these are systematic long-term consequences, we can predict something about the value of them, uh, then they may well uh, actually be the best way of judging our actions rather than based on the, the short-term immediate consequences. Uh, and it could be that, uh, that I mean, a very clear one that could be very important is um, preserving humanity itself, uh, but perhaps there are other ways of having very good long-term in- uh, impacts uh, that, that Nick Beckstead calls trajectory changes um, based on path dependency, but short of um, uh, saving most of the value in civilization. Maybe you just make it a hundredth better uh, for all time to come. And so I think that there's still an open question about that and whether there are other techniques like this of affecting the long term, uh, which could rival uh, trying to avoid extinction. There's an interesting thing that goes on uh, when w- when you make the more modest argument that it would be good to ensure that we don't go extinct so that your children and your grandchildren and your, and your great-grandchildren can continue to live and, and, and have good lives. Uh, then people are, are inclined, I think, to, to go along with that. And then when you make uh, seemingly the, the, the dominatingly stronger argument that it would be good if your, your, your children and your, and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren lived plus another 100,000 generations and perhaps, uh, you know, creature, creatures that are uh, kind of post-human in a way when, when we might have changed uh, humanity uh, such that, that we're no longer immediately recognizable. People, mm-hmm. even though that is kind of a strictly stronger argument in a sense because it includes all of the things you cared about before plus mm-hmm. other additional things that might be even more valuable... Uh, people are people are more more skeptical about that and and tend to push back and that they feel like they're getting tricked here somehow. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think one aspect is that it it just starts to get very abstract. Um, and often when things uh, are more abstract and less concrete, um, we start to say some pretty strange things. <laughs> um, maybe we use it more of as an opportunity to uh, to say something clever sounding or to uh, to express some of our values. Um, rather than to actually just push for the things that are clearly of, of value. Uh, so, yeah, I, <laughs> that's, that's, that's my best guess on that. Yeah. So that's your explanation for why uh, perhaps someone who really, ca- really cares about ensuring that the healthcare system saves a lot of lives might at the pub say, oh, who cares if we all die? <laughs> so, yeah. are, are they fully thinking this through? Maybe we should just uh, you know, abolish uh, the National Healthcare Service because uh, who really cares one way or the other? <laughs> Yeah, ex- exactly. Um, I think it's getting too abstract for them. Um, and also those conversations at the pub normally don't really matter. Um, yeah. It's not that someone's going to implement the thing that they said. If they were told someone is going to implement the thing you, you say, yeah. maybe they would, they would probably be quite a lot more careful before saying things like that. Yeah. If they were told, oh, well, it's an interesting argument we made. Uh, so you made, uh, we're going to remove all of the safeguards on the use of nuclear weapons uh, now because it just doesn't really matter whether they're used or not, whether whether humanity goes extinct, or maybe they'd want to do some further research before really committing to that. Uh, I think so. Um, and uh, s- s- it is it is interesting to trace these consequences and try to see where the inconsistencies are between the different things people say and then tr- try to see how they can make them consistent. And I think that uh, this is actually a lot of what uh, moral philosophy is about um, when a lot of people who, who don't study this uh, do wonder what the hell it is that we, uh, we, we do. Uh, but a lot of it is uh, trying to think about our intuitions and notice when they're in conflict with each other and then to try to work out the best ways of resolving those conflicts. Mm. Uh, another interesting example uh, is when looking at climate change, uh, this is going to have a lot of uh, bad effects uh, for many generations. 
Uh, and some people uh, suggest that it, it may even be so bad as uh, to perhaps be able to cause human extinction itself, uh, which uh, every time I've heard that brought up, people, uh, I think, correctly say, you know, wow, that's even worse than, than we thought. They don't say, oh, well, I guess that to the extent to which it could cause human extinction, um, it's actually better than I thought, um, <laughs> because that wouldn't be bad at all if that happens. <laughs> I think it would certainly raise eyebrows if you, as, as you said, if you ran on that as a political platform. <laughs> exactly. Uh, outside of the pub, no one would say that. I think it's just a, it's a kind of, um, yeah. It has a certain glibness to it. <laughs> exactly. So we'll move on to uh, objections uh, to, to this view in a minute, but are there any other uh, reasons to be con- to, to prioritize thinking about uh, the long-term future of humanity that you wanted to highlight first? Uh, sure. I mean, I think it's interesting to just see where all of this comes from. Um, so the way I see it is that all of this is a, uh, um, immediate consequence of, uh, what I call long-termism, uh, which is just this very natural view that people matter just as much, no matter when they exist. And I think most people would agree with that if stated, um, uh, clearly like that as a principle. Uh, but I don't, think that people reflect much on what would follow from it. And I think that what's surprising is that there are ways of affecting the well-being of people who might live millions of years hence. Uh, And this this comes from the fact that there are ways of locking in a terrible outcome uh, uh, that the people of the future can't do anything to recover from. Um, Because you can see that if if it wasn't locked in like that, uh, then there would be this question about, well, how is it that I'm more capable of helping someone in a million years' time than I am of helping someone now? Um, uh, But you can see that in a case like extinction, uh, where there's no people left uh, to be able to recover from extinction, um, uh, that that would be a case uh, where we, uh, before that event, are uniquely privileged to be able to do something about it. We're in this position of very high leverage. and that is a way uh, in which it's also fairly clear that no improvements in technology in the intervening time period would get the other people out of the mess that they're in because there won't be any people to invent these technologies and there'll be no way to come back from it. Um, so it's a fairly clear case um, of why it could be uh, that our actions now could affect um, the lives, whether there are lives at all, um, of people over millions of years. Uh, and then uh, combined with this long-termism, uh, it really has this very dramatic effect. Um, uh, and that's true whether you think about the well-being of these lives or whether you think about the achievements uh, within them. Um, and there are also other cases uh, beyond extinction. Uh, for example, a perpetual global totalitarianism, um, where some stable system of ensuring dictatorial rule uh, is set up in such a way that uh, people within the regime can never break out. Um, if people want to see a good example of that, uh, Orwell's 1984 is basically set up exactly to do that. Um, uh, building uh, a very detailed and very stable system uh, where it is uh, quite unclear about whether humanity could break out of it over um, many thousands of years. Uh, and, that, and so and these cases... kind of exists in, in North Korea today. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a good point. Uh, North Korea may be like that. I think that it's not as clear based on the leaders, if the leaders were to die, um, uh, whether it it is stable to that. Um, uh, people were, were seriously worried about this, um, uh, reaching a global level uh, last century uh, with uh, the rise of uh, Nazism. Mm. Um, and where this was, you know, it was attempted to create a perpetual global totalitarianism. Uh, people were trying for this. Um, North Korea is probably um, uh, less stable to threats from without, um, but if it reached a global level um, for some kind of system, uh, then this could be stable. Uh, and there are other more benign-sounding ways in which uh, we could reach that. If you imagine um, a civilization where we uh, we think about ethics and we get very excited by some ethical system, uh, which actually misses most of the value uh, that we could have. Now, I think everyone probably has their own ideas about that, their own favorite, you know, systems that they think miss out on most of what really matters, whether that's because those systems uh, perhaps just count pleasure and don't count other deeper things of life, or whether they're systems that uh, um, that just want kind of everyday life like it is today to continue rather than things which could be much better. Um, and if we prematurely converged to 
um, to a really problematic ethical system, which actually misses out on most of the value that we could have created. Um, uh, then uh, we may even um, enthusiastically you know, teach uh, this system to our children in their moral education and extol its virtues and be very worried that someone would create a different system that would kind of get things wrong. Uh, and we might uh, deliberately lock ourselves into a set of values uh, which stop us uh, producing most of the value we could have created. Uh, so I think that there are forms like extinction, um, there, and there are various other forms of lock-in, uh, where something like our values gets locked in, or a particular form of political institution that's oppressive gets locked in, uh, maybe that just represents a very small minority's values. Um, you can even have cases where no one's values are being supported. It's just certain kinds of um, uh, horrible institutional equilibria where no one can really do anything uh, unilaterally to break out of it. Um, so there's a whole lot of different ways in which uh, we could have this lock-in um, and irrevocably lose uh, almost all of the value that we could have had. Uh, and so th these are called existential risks, if, if some of the listeners haven't heard this term. Uh, they include extinction and all of these other types of cases that are logically similar in that there's this irrevocable loss of almost all the value that we could have had. You use the term uh, long-termism. Is that mm -hmm. the, the name now for this school of thought? Uh, well, that's the word I'm using. Uh, I, I haven't heard much um, uh, detailed conversation around this connection to uh, existential risk, uh, but I think it's very useful to actually just uh, have a name uh, for this, this wider set of ideas that uh, what we really want to be thinking about is the long term. Uh, some some people uh, in the effective altruism community have played around with terms like uh, thinking about the far future um, or the distant future. And this captures one aspect very well, um, which is that uh, we're not merely interested in the next 100 years or 200 years. It could be a very long time period, um, which really gives power to this argument. Uh, however, it also conjures up this idea that we're just concerned with what they do at that time and not at any of the intervening times. Um, it seems kind of this strange idea that we're preoccupied with what some, you know, possibly small group of people do uh, a million years hence. Um, whereas I think it breaks a lot of the mystery out of it and just gets more to the root of what we're talking about. If we're thinking about the long term, we're just thinking about every generation equally, um, uh, rather than having this connotation that we're thinking about generations that are distant rather than generations that are nearby. Um, we're just actually impartial between them. I've heard other terms like uh, preservationism, and I suppose you could also, we, we could have called it conservationism, except that that has a clear uh, environmental meaning now. Uh, that, that's right. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, there's still interesting questions about what's the best terminology for some of this. Uh, I totally agree. I, I also think that there's a, some very interesting um, connections between this very simple basic idea um, about uh, safeguarding civilization um, and avoiding existential risk. Um, compared to environmentalism. Environmentalism is fundamentally uh, about avoiding um, this irrevocable destruction of ecosystems uh, and avoiding uh, the irrevocable loss of species. Uh, these are two of the, the key ideas of environmentalism and very similar um, about this irrevocable loss and the fact that it would happen for all time is, is a very deep aspect of it. Um, and what and it's also to do with a kind of lock-in. Um, it's something you know that, that you lose and that you can see in virtue of losing it why it is that you can't get it back. Uh, and so it is very similar in that regard. It's just that what we're talking about here uh, is something that's, that's much bigger, uh, uh, much bigger than that. Uh, I also think that uh, if you, you were talking about um, conservationism, uh, conservatism uh, as a political uh, system actually has some similarities as well. Uh, it's partly at least based on this idea that there's something very special uh, about the society uh, wh who's making these judgments uh, and that uh, if we were too radical and too progressive and we change too quickly, uh, maybe we'll lose uh, some of these aspects, uh, these norms and institutions uh, that actually enable us to function very well and have these great aspects of our society. Uh, and that there could be this irrevocable loss of, um, of what really made things work uh, and that maybe we need to go somewhat more slowly and carefully uh, when we're doing it. And I think that these ideas are, are very attractive to people, um, and that makes sense, uh, that there, there is something to be said for prudence in these, these areas. Uh, in fact, when I think of conservatism like that, uh, I'm uh, 
I think it's much more reasonable view than I, than I do when I often hear uh, conservatives uh, uh, talking about it. The current generation, some people, I, I guess, count as as long termists, and uh, and some some people don't. Uh, I guess if you if you're being negative about that, you might think that the, the current generation has become a bit narcissistic and and is extremely focused just on its own welfare and perhaps isn't thinking enough about uh, you know what's gonna what's gonna become of our children and our grandchildren. What do we know though about the views of previous generations? Was was this view kind of how most people thought about you know civilization and and uh, the future in the past? Or were, were they more concerned than than we are with ensuring that that things kept on going? So it's a good question. I, I think that um, for most of human history, um, uh, they weren't, or, and at least for the the types of issues that that we're thinking about of the end of humanity, uh, uh, we can come to some of this later, but. Ultimately, the natural risks are relatively small. And uh, look, I'll, I'll give the argument now. Um, we can see that natural risks to humanity must be fairly small uh, because humanity has survived about 2,000 centuries so far. Um, so uh, this means that the risk can't really be that much higher than about one in 2,000 per century, or you have to explain why, you know, coincidentally, we managed to get through all of these centuries. Uh, you can make that, uh, that argument tighter, um, and I've, uh, I've written a paper on this, uh, and you end up with, with the idea that natural risks, um, the kind of mean time between um, extinction events is something in between about 200,000 years uh, or um, all the way up to about 100 million years. Um, but it, it really can't be uh, in the area of, of uh, 1,000 years or, or even 10,000 years. Um, so it must be the case that we could expect to survive um, many, many more centuries of natural risks, even if we didn't do anything about them. Um, uh, but in contrast, it's only since the development of nuclear weapons uh, that we've really had enough power um, as a species uh, to be able to destroy ourselves and ushering in these new anthropogenic risks, uh, which I think are at much higher levels. Um, and so uh, this is, I think, the reason why uh, common sense morality, um, you know, the kinds of um, ideas about morality that, that we heard growing up um, and that, that our parents and our grandparents uh, instantiate, uh, the reason why this doesn't talk much about um, the conservation of humanity itself, uh, because this just wasn't really an issue uh, until uh, the 1940s. Um, and so it's, and there was one generation from then until the end of the Cold War, um, and then another generation uh, really since that. Uh, so we're actually at the vanguard of people um, who've seen a particular threat, nuclear weapons, and are now starting to see the rise of new threats like this and are generalizing it all together um, with this idea of existential risk. Um, and when it comes to that, that first threat of nuclear weapons, uh, there was a lot of action on this. Um, my parents uh, went on anti-nuclear marches and I think took me along as a baby uh, on these marches. Um, it, was a, it was a huge topic. It, it kind of was swept through um, uh, popular culture. Um, there's lots of songs, um, satirical songs and, um, and uh, um, more uh, earnest songs about... Uh, avoiding this nuclear threat, um, and it, you know, many different parts of our culture it pervaded and caused a lot of people to really fight this fight. Um, but it did all of that under the banner of nuclear weapons and the anti-nuclear movement, um, rather than uh, already generalizing to the idea of um, trying to preserve humanity. Um, and that idea was only really able to be had once we started to think um, about additional threats in addition to uh, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, but I really see this as a growing out of that anti-nuclear movement. And I think that was the first time when humanity really started to rise to that challenge. Uh, and then, um, um, you know, our generation uh, is a generation that mostly grew up outside of the Cold War and this shadow of nuclear war. Um, and, you know, we've, we've missed out on a bit of that moral seriousness that happened back then. Just thinking about the attitudes of past generations uh, a little bit more. Uh, so it seems like in uh, you know in, in the Middle Ages there would have been at least a lot of concern about the continuation of a particular cultural or, or ethnic group and ensuring that it wasn't wiped out by by other groups. I should think that you know the Scots kind of want to preserve their integrity and make sure mm -hmm. that Scotland continues to exist. 
Uh, and that might have been more common at that time because it was a, a more violent era in which you know some groups really did uh, displace others completely uh, mm -hmm. through war. And then uh, looking back even further, we're, we're, we're both Australians, and uh, I imagine we're, we're both familiar with the idea that Indigenous Australians, uh, b before uh, Europeans arrived, uh, had a kind of very long-term perspective within their culture about, uh, you know, the connection to the land and the need to uh, preserve it so that, you know, uh, many, many future generations of their own uh, tribe yeah. could uh, continue to to benefit from it. And I think it's, it's looking at... Uh, uh, groups like that, that the, the current generation uh, does seem a little bit narcissistic. But perhaps that's an idealized impression of what Indigenous Australians thought. And, and you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, their their concerns were more more prosaic. Uh, but well, it's, uh, a, it's a it's a good question. I mean, that could be a good place to to look to for inspiration. Uh, the you know, the figure when I was uh, growing up uh, was that uh, the Australian Aboriginal uh, populations had been around for about. Uh, 40,000 years uh, before now. And I believe that there's just been some um, very strong new evidence that extends that up to 70,000 years. Um, so that's about a third of the lifespan of Homo sapiens uh, that they've been around in Australia. Um, so they, they have really in one place, you know, managed to uh, survive for uh, an incredibly long time. Uh, and then in Tasmania, uh, the population there actually, um, like you know, you were talking about with Scotland or something, um, managed to be driven completely to extinction uh, by white settlers, uh, and they actually saw um, you know a localized version of of an existential disaster. Um, so there could be a lot to to think about um, from the Australian example. Mm. Yeah, just to build on that, I think almost everyone regards that as virtuous and kind of it. it Maybe maybe it's true, maybe it's not. But if it was true that Indigenous Australians spent tens of thousands of years, you know, passing the torch from one generation to another, mm -hmm. making sure that at no point did they damage the land so much that future generations couldn't survive on it and flourish on it, that I think almost everyone thinks that that is a, an impressive achievement and a good thing that they did, and it and it speaks well of them. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's just interesting that I think those people then might not. Uh, push to have the same attitude instantiated in the, in the current generation as much as, as perhaps they should if they really thought about it. Uh, yeah. But, no, I, I, th I think that there could be an inconsistency there. Yeah. yeah. And, and that by contrast, that the current generation just constantly inventing kind of new dangerous things and uh, throwing, yeah, just changing, changing culture incredibly rapidly and, and taking risks and, you know, running, running the risk of international war looks, looks quite foolhardy by comparison. Yeah, I mean, to, to be clear, uh, I'm uh, I'm no opponent of uh, technology. Uh, uh, these this rise in technology um, was associated with this amazing rise in prosperity uh, and bringing um, ever more people out of poverty in, in absolute terms. Um, so, uh, and if you if you exclude um, the possibility of these existential risks, uh, then it's very clear that uh, that actually. Uh, technology was very positive on net. Um, the smaller risks that it had, um, uh, you know, were dwarfed by the the improvements. And you can see that just by the fact that human lifespan, you know, um, basically mm. doubled uh, mm. under this period of rapid technological improvement. Um, even taking into account all of the um, uh, the ill health that the technology um, produced as well, um, you know, the net effect was to double lifespan. Uh, so. Uh, it's produced huge benefits, uh, and I think that it's. I don't know if you can really blame people that much, at least individuals, for not really having seen that it's exposing us to these risks, um, risks that haven't yet um, eventuated, uh, but that this is the uh, you know this kind of double-edged sword. Um, uh, of technology that it comes with this. And because they haven't yet eventuated, it also makes it very hard to work out the actual probabilities for these things. Mm. Uh, although there was, um, uh, you know, an, an interesting attempt by that by um, uh, John F. Kennedy, who, um, uh, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, uh, he wrote down that he'd, he'd put the risk of uh, precipitating a uh, thermonuclear war with the Soviet Union as somewhere between one in three and evens. Um, and he was one of the two people, you know, who could have precipitated that war. Um, so, you know, we, we have some very, you know, serious judgments by people who should know, um, which suggests that the, the chance of, 
um, massive nuclear war in that situation was very high. Um, and so uh, the, those words, you know, are not that widely known, though. Hmm. Well, uh, we've, we've made the case for here, and I think mm-hmm. that the audience can probably tell mm-hmm. if they uh, didn't know already that I'm uh, in, in pretty strong agreement. But maybe let's now consider some of the objections, uh, you know, the, the serious, uh, thoughtful objections that that people make, uh, both uh, to, to the to the underlying idea philosophically, and then to whether this actually has any any practical implications for us. Great. Probably the most common philosophical objection I hear is uh, called the the, the person-affecting view, which is the idea that uh, we should be concerned with uh, raising the welfare of the current generation, but not uh, so much changing the number of people who exist in in the future. Do you want to talk about that Mm -hmm. for a minute? Yeah, sure. Um, So uh, this is a uh, pretty popular um, intuition uh, that people have uh, when it comes to population ethics, which is the study of uh, thinking about how to assess uh, acts that change who it is who will come into existence. Uh, and the uh, the slogan uh, that uh, person-affecting views often appeal to is this idea that uh, ethics is about making people happy, not about making happy people. Okay. And a lot of the um, uh, the intuition comes from a related idea, uh, which is that we shouldn't make uh, sacrifices um, just for the sake of merely possible people. Um, so, for example, uh, if uh, if someone who is a long termist uh, suggested that uh, maybe we should try to avoid existential risk, and someone else said, "Well, it doesn't." You know, it doesn't matter um, because you know. Suppose the disaster will happen, and those people never will exist. Um, and uh, you know, it might just be for these merely possible people uh, that one's trying to um, make these uh, make these sacrifices. Or another way to say that is that um, there's nothing wrong in just letting the disaster happen um, because those people remain merely possible in the world where you let the disaster happen. They're not actual. Um, and so how can it be wrong if it doesn't affect any real actual people? It would only affect these possible people. Um, I think that that sounds rhetorically good, um, but if you think about it, um, it doesn't really work. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one is that there's a bit of extra rhetorical effect that's coming from the idea of it being merely possible. Um, for example, a unicorn is a merely possible uh, being. There are no actual unicorns. And indeed, therefore, they don't make any difference in ethics. Um, it's, you know, you shouldn't have any ethical role for unicorns. Um, but uh, the the possible people who would exist if we avoided a disaster are not merely possible in the sense that a unicorn is. Um, they would exist if we were to take a different action. Uh, and uh, their, in fact, their existence hinges upon the action that we're about to take. Uh, so it's a little bit like saying, um, I'm not going to consider a merely possible healthcare system, uh, which is the healthcare system that would be implemented were I to kind of sign this bill. Um, and, you know, I, because I'm not going to sign the bill, it doesn't matter because it was a merely possible healthcare system or something like that. It's a, you know, it's a bit ridiculous. Um, uh, so that, that's one aspect. Um, but another is that, uh, that ultimately, even people uh, who support person-affecting views, the only plausible person-affecting views um, uh, also care about me- these merely possible people. Um, and we can see this. Uh, so the, uh, the way to see this is to consider people whose lives are worse uh, than nothing. So people perhaps who have such a tortured existence, um, uh, maybe they're born with a, a, a very rare and terrible condition, or maybe they, um, they grow up in some terrible totalitarian regime or something um, where their life is worse than nothing, um, so, so filled with pain and suffering. Uh, now, everyone agrees that it's, uh, it's a bad thing if these people come into existence uh, rather than not. Uh, we should go to some effort to avoid there being additional tortured lives. Um, uh, so uh, therefore, the people with person-affecting views also agree with that, um, and they would make sacrifices to avoid these people uh, coming into existence, uh, which means that, uh, that they would make sacrifices on behalf of merely possible people. Um, so the whole stuff about merely possible is ultimately a red herring, um, and one shouldn't appeal to that intuition at all because uh, everyone 
uh, ultimately agrees that in some cases you should help these merely possible people. Um, and so the people with person-affecting views generally instead move to the following kind of claim, um, or at least they're, they're logically forced to. <laughs> some of them keep talking about mere possibilities, but it, that argument just doesn't work. Um, so they move to this other view, which is to talk about what's called the asymmetry. Um, and here's this, the, the following claim is the asymmetry, uh, that it's bad to add lives that aren't worth living, but it isn't good to add lives that are worth living. There's an asymmetric situation, they would argue. Um, uh, it's just neutral to add lives uh, that are worth living, um, you know, uh, but uh, it's actively bad to add those that are, that are, say, tortured lives. Now, I think that that sounds plausible. Um, it's, it's not as rhetorically powerful as the, the um, mere possibility argument that, that ultimately didn't work, um, but it's actually very difficult to get this asymmetry to work as well. Um, so consider that here's the here's the nub of it. Um, uh, consider the following three options. Uh, you could add uh, you could not add anyone to the population, okay, um, or you could add a new person uh, who has a modest quality of life, or you could add that exact same person um, but add a higher quality of life. Um, now clearly it's better to add them at a higher quality than to add them at a modest quality. Uh, everyone's got to agree with that uh, that it's a uh, um, otherwise, you get ridiculous consequences that um, if you're going to create people, it doesn't matter how well off they are, um, uh, even when they actually do get created. Um, so they agree that it's better to add them at a high quality than at a modest quality, but they also want to say that adding them at a modest quality is equal to not adding them, and adding them at a high quality is equal to not adding them. Um, uh, but if you hold all of those views simultaneously, then you've got a contradiction um, because it can't be better to have them than to not have them, but with both of those things being equal. Sorry, it can't be better to have them at a higher quality than at a modest quality um, while both of those numbers are also equally good as not having them at all. Um, so you have a contradiction there. Uh, and one can try to get around that, uh, but it's actually very difficult to get it to work. Um, there's, you know, I won't get into the, the exact technicalities, but you can try to have partial orderings um, and you can try to have uh, um, various bits of non-standard decision theory. Um, so people have been trying to get a version of this off the ground um, since the asymmetry was first uh, discussed in, in 1967, so the last 50 years. Um, and there's no plausible worked out theory that's been developed. Um, and no consensus has arisen. In fact, I'm not aware of any philosophers uh, who support person-affecting views who actually, um, in, in their papers, uh, use the person-affecting theory worked out by another philosopher. Um, it sem seems to be just that people create their own uh, system and then people find problems with that. And people sometimes support their own view, but they never support each other's views. It's just kind of really scattered. Um, so it doesn't seem to be working out. Uh, and among other things, uh, any attempt to do this um, basically requires modifying standard decision theory in, e in order to even state these theories. Um, and then they violate a number of axioms of rationality, uh, which leads to time inconsistency uh, and cyclic preferences. Um, so they get into situations where they think that um, if you have options uh, A and B available, um, you should do B. If you have options uh, B and C available, uh, you should do uh, C. And if you have A and C available, you should do A. Um, and this leads them uh, to have all kinds of problems that uh, that people who study rationality tend to say that a, a system really can't have these properties and still be rational. Uh, so I think it's, it's very hard to get a version of these person-affecting views to work. Um, however, it may be possible, and maybe uh, maybe I'll be surprised, and that their consensus will emerge, you know, in the next uh, ten years or something, and people will work out how to do it. Um, uh, but even if that's true, uh, this whole area of person affecting views just argues against uh, the idea that it's because of the um, the opportunity cost of all of the well being of people in future generations uh, that means that avoiding existential risk is really important. Um, all of the other types of arguments about the achievements that we could we could have uh, for humanity, um, about virtues, about the uh, the the kind of contract over the you know the chain of unbroken generations, um, and about our cosmic significance, um, all of those would still be left untouched by this. I think. Um, so, ultimately, I don't think it's too much of a danger. 
uh, person, I've, I've never actually heard uh, a description of the person affecting view that is clear enough that it makes uh, sense to me, that it doesn't uh, avoid, that it's not uh, incredibly vague in order to avoid directly contradicting itself. Uh, but even, even if the person affecting view were true, it seems like it would uh, create much stronger consequences than what most of its um, supporters uh, expect it to. So one thing would be, what if you believe, as I think is sensible, that people's identity changes over time as they age and that uh, in different futures, if you go down different paths in life, then in a sense, you're a, you're a different person. You could then end up indifferent between those two different parts, right? Because there's no common person between the two of them. Have you heard that argument? Uh, I I haven't seen seen that in the literature, um, but it's uh, it, you know it's what you get if you think about person affecting views uh, combined with the kind of personal identity ideas that Derek Parfit has, um, and so maybe he talks about this somewhere. Uh, and I've thought about it a bit myself before, mm. uh, uh, and it does seem to be an issue for those views. So another line of objections that I encounter is that we shouldn't be too concerned about future generations because we should have a high discount rate on their welfare or just on the future in general. And I think uh, my training is in economics. And when you bring up these issues with economists, they tend to quickly start talking about about discount rates. Uh, Do you want to describe why you think that is a misguided uh, concern? Sure. Uh, I mean, I can say say quite a bit about that. Um, so uh, a discount rate, uh, if any of the audience haven't heard the term, uh, the idea is that you have some uh, percentage amount uh, per unit time uh, that things that happen in the future get discounted by, um, that makes them less important. So for example, you might say that there's a discount rate of 5% per annum. Um, so things that happen uh, a year from now only matter 95% as much as things that happen this year. And things that happen a year after that only matter uh, 95% squared times as much. So that's about around about 90% as much as things that happen now. Uh, and that uh, things that happen you know, in 100 years uh, matter a very tiny amount uh, compared to things that happen now. Um, effectively, you're just multiplying um, uh, things by a kind of exponentially decreasing function. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's equivalent to if you thought that there was a 5% chance of extinction every year. Um, because if you thought that there was a 5% chance of extinction every year, then you'd think that the value of those times was, you know, was smaller by, by that factor. Um, so there are a whole lot of good reasons to do discounting. And in fact, the main times when economists do discounting is that they discount things which are measured in dollars. Um, and there are a whole lot of good reasons um, to discount things that are measured in dollars. And the main reason that this is done is because uh, in the future we'll be richer, um, uh, so growth, economic growth will have continued, uh, and also there's diminishing marginal returns on uh, additional uh, uh, income or consumption uh, in terms of money. So the idea there is that um, maybe you know one measurement of this suggests that um, that the value you get out of money is logarithmic in the amount of money that you have access to, um, such that doubling uh, the amount of your income gives you one more unit of of happiness, uh, no matter kind of where you started in terms of money. Um, uh, so. Uh, if you combine those ideas of diminishing marginal returns on money and the fact that we'll be richer in the future, it means that like financial benefits, if they're going to happen in the future, have to be bigger in order to make the same impact as, as ones that happen now. And that all just makes sense. Um, and this is the, the um, uh, Ramsey's measure, method of discounting. Uh, but they also, on top of that very sensible thing, they often add in an additional uh, discount rate um, called the pure rate of time preference. And that's the contentious thing. Um, they just add in this extra 1% or something of discounting on top of that. Uh, and uh, pretty much all philosophers who have ever considered this, possibly possibly 100% of them, uh, think that the extra 1% or whatever is just a mistake. Um, uh, and 
this 1% gets kind of produced by asking uh, economists, asking uh, people questions about how, you know, would you rather have, um, you know, this benefit in a year or this other benefit in two years and a whole lot of questions like that. Um, but it doesn't actually, if you look at the, the literature on this, um, there's no stable answer to these questions. They depend a very large amount on the framing uh, and also on the precise way the question is asked. Um, and in fact, if you look at the, the more detailed literature that's come out in the last 20 years on this, uh, you'll see that there is uh, that the pure kind of time preference people have, um, which uh, is sometimes called, I think correctly, impatience, um, is actually, uh, it's not an exponential rate of decay, it's a hyperbolic rate of decay, um, which leads to uh, problems of rationality and time inconsistency. Um, and that we're basically just measuring a form of human impatience and irrationality and then trying to add it into political decision-making, um, uh, whereas it doesn't seem to be the kind of thing that one you know, should be respecting at all. Um, you know, it's just like finding a cognitive bias that we have and then kind of adding it back into your economic analysis in order to make your analysis biased in the same way. Uh, so that's kind of my summary of uh, pure rate of time preference um, generally. Uh, whereas uh, you you should um, uh, discount uh, future well-being uh, by the chance that we're not around to realize it. Uh, that definitely makes sense. Um, so you could discount by the extinction rate. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I ultimately think that there's some very good articles on this, actually, um, uh, by uh, Yu Kuang Ng, uh, who did some foundational work on this, I think, in the 90s, um, that uh, ultimately for the long-term future, we should just be discounting it uh, by the extinction rate. And uh, this is the basic idea that Nicholas Stern incorporated into, the, uh, uh, into his uh, uh, famous Stern review uh, as well. Mm. I think we needn't dwell on this uh, too long because, as you say, it has basically 0% support among people who have seriously thought about it. But but just to give an idea of how crazy it is, uh, if you uh, applied a, a time preference of just 1% per annum, um, mm -hmm. a pure rate of time preference of just 1% per annum, that would imply that uh, the welfare of Tutankhamun was more important than that of all 7 billion humans that are alive today, which I think uh, is, is an example of why basically no one, having thought about this properly, uh, believes that, that this is a sensible moral philosophical view. Exactly. Uh, and I should add that with this experimental work that's been done to try to measure um, uh, people's uh, impatience, uh, if you ask a different question, if you don't ask about yourself, but you ask about someone else, uh, for example, um, I mean, we know that people are, you know, have these problems of time consistency. For example, the classic one is dieting, uh, that people in the moment, um, you know, want to eat the cake, uh, but they kind of wish that they, they hadn't done that. Um, so we know that people have these kinds of um, problems. <laughs> Of, uh, of impatience. Uh, but if they're trying to, um, uh, to advise their child or something like that, or their partner, uh, they'll often, you know, try to, they, they won't exhibit the same kind of time preference. Uh, and they'll actually be thinking about the long-term benefits for that person um, when they're being altruistic about it. Uh, and so people have actually asked the question, not as uh, your own time preference, but would you prefer, uh, you know, would it be better um, if there was a, a certain social program that would produce a whole lot of benefits at this time or some other social benefit, uh, some other program that produces these benefits at this later time? Uh, and they found that people are actually indifferent uh, to these things. So they actually don't exhibit this pure time preference uh, when asked about altruistic questions, at least the early bits of research on that. Um, and that seems to be exactly the type of question that we're asking now. Um, and so uh, I think it is pretty clear that uh, that one shouldn't be doing this this pure time preference on uh, uh, on moral questions uh, about how should we value future generations. Uh, third class of objections is about whether the future will actually be desirable. Because if you thought that it was as likely for the future to be you know, bad morally, uh, just an unpleasant place to be, mm -hmm. as to be good, then that really would, I think, uh, shift your focus. Uh, perhaps you would still be focused on the long-term consequences and trying to make it more likely to be positive than negative, but it would certainly make you less concerned about extinction. Do you, do you want to talk, comment on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, ultimately, that that is uh, that is right. Uh, at least if we, we're taking the 
um, you know, the well-being type justification um, that it's the well-being in future generations. And if that well-being um, were uh, as likely to be, you know, negative as positive to the same degree, you know, so something such that the expected well-being um, in future generations was zero or negative, um, uh, then, then yes, uh, there wouldn't be any point in preserving it. Um, uh, so that would bite. Um, I don't think that there's that much justification for believing this. Um, uh, at, uh, at, if you look through the history of writing on this topic, uh, there have been people at all times uh, who have thought that, you know, who've been very pessimistic and thought that perhaps it's all not worth it. Uh, Schopenhauer was a famous example who thought maybe it would be better if, uh, if the earth had been as lifeless as the moon. Um, uh, but I do think that if you, at least if you're not in a moment of clinical depression uh, and you you actually read some things about uh, the great achievements of human history uh, and uh, and our civilization and what it's been able to do, or if you think about you know various moments of, of tenderness and kind of peak experiences in your life and and you know others, uh, I think it's it's pretty clear that it's uh, that it's very largely net positive uh, and that it, that it was uh, a while back uh, and that it's got even better uh, subsequently uh, with all of the improvements to the human condition that have come from uh, um, modern prosperity. Um, uh, I think that the the best kind of argument uh, that it's actually um, uh, bad uh, overall, or that it's that it's going to be bad, um, is probably when thinking about our treatment of animals, uh, which uh, has got worse uh, over time. Um, you could, you might also say the same about our treatment of the environment, but actually, in a lot of ways, the treatment of the environment has uh, got worse um, and peaked in badness in the twentieth century, and then has started to become less bad. Um, and this kind of shape of curve about how much damage we're doing that starts off small, becomes big, and then goes back to being small again um, has has been suggested as this uh, Kuznets curves uh, in economics, um, and. My guess is that the similar thing is going to happen with treatment of animals, um, that it's it's got worse. Uh, but as we get more and more prosperous, uh, since there are people who, who value uh, the well-being of the animals and there's no one who's just going out of their way to, or almost no one, apart from a few crazy people, going out of their way to actually hurt animals, um, it's mainly just that people want slightly cheaper um, chicken. Uh, that as prosperity rises, uh, that will become less and less important to them uh, to get the slightly cheaper chicken um, and uh, then, um, you know, when it just costs a penny more, you know, effectively um, to get the, the ethically raised one, uh, then either they will just do that or governments will find that there's not much political resistance to actually just banning these things. Uh, and whereas there's a lot of votes to be gained from banning them. And so, you know, they'll just move to humane practices. Um, so I, I think this really does seem to make sense that, uh, that this treatment will become better in the future. Mm. Um, but I think here's a, um, here's a, there's a, there's a really good quote, um, uh, by Carl Sagan about this. Uh, so I'll, I'll say what, what he had to say about this question. Uh, he said, uh, I do not imagine that it's precisely we with our present customs and social conventions who will be out there. If we continue to accumulate only power and not wisdom, we will surely destroy ourselves. Our very existence in that distant time requires that we will have changed our institutions and ourselves. How can I dare to guess about humans in the far future? It is, I think, only a matter of natural selection. If we become even slightly more violent, short-sighted, ignorant, and selfish than we are now, almost certainly we will have no future. Uh, and I think that that is, that that is kind of right, um, that... This is a diff very difficult time uh, that, that we're in now, um, and it's going to be it's going to be tricky. We'll have to rise to the challenge um, if we want to get through it. Um, and I think that uh, that conditional upon us being the type of species and civilization that does rise to that challenge uh, and manages to achieve more civilizational wisdom, uh, that you know, we're likely to, you know, even more likely to produce a positive outcome uh, compared to a negative outcome than you might have thought before that. Mm. I'm fairly optimistic about the future because as our technology improves and, and our wisdom improves, admittedly at a, at a slower rate, um, we're getting more and more capable of shaping our environment and ensuring that it's pleasant for us. Um, so it seems 
fairly clear that human well-being has risen uh, over the last few hundred years. Although I, I guess I guess you could object that perhaps now we have weaker community, even though we're richer, and so in fact we're not we're not more fulfilled. And some some people do make that argument. But even if it's not true in the past, I think if we do stick around for many hundreds of years, uh, it's unlikely that we won't eventually at some point figure out the science or the technology required to to really create a very high levels of human flourishing, h- higher than what uh, people today uh, enjoy. Uh, if you look at farm animals, as you say, it seems pretty likely that their lives uh, have more unpleasant things in them than, than pleasant things. Um, what, if we want to predict what the future will be like, one uh, option will be to, to look at the past and see, see what that has been like in general and project that forward. Uh, the, the largest group uh, of beings in the world today and certainly throughout history has been uh, wild animals. Um, they're like neither neither quite like humans nor nor like farmed animals. Uh, do you think their their lives overall have been positive or negative or, or neutral? Uh, yeah, that's it's a very good question. Um, I'll firstly say just to to modify that slightly um, by if you count them, um, there are definitely more wild mammals than there are humans, um, more wild birds than there are humans, and so on. Um, but uh, they're generally very small. Um, you know, so it's the smallest ones uh, that produce most of these these population numbers. You know, so tiny little voles and and things like that for the mammals, rather than, you know, we tend to imagine it's kind of tigers and things like that. Um, uh, but actually, uh, if you look at uh, at the brains uh, of all of these animals, uh, the brains of uh, of the collective humanity are actually have more neurons in them uh, than uh, all of the other mammals put together, including the wild mammals. Um, so, uh, and the same is true for, if, you know, we have more than the wild mammals plus birds put together. Um, so because we don't really know um, what it is about a brain uh, that produces uh, conscious experiences, um, it, it's, it's plausible that, uh, that it's, you know, that uh, more neurons uh, means more, uh, more suffering, um, or more pleasure. Um, and so we don't really know how all of that works. And it is actually plausible that we are from this kind of intrinsic perspective, uh, more important than all of these other things put together. Um, but I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but then to, to speak to the, to the real question, uh, which is, uh, uh, the suffering, uh, in, in nature. Um, yeah, there's a tremendous amount of it. Um, uh, and we, we sometimes have these idealized pictures of nature, uh, but if you read, um, what, uh, uh, biologists, you know, who go out in the field, uh, write about, uh, these things that there's, there is a tremendous amount of, uh, suffering nature being read in tooth and claw. Um, and, uh, I don't know whether it's, uh, whether, um, ultimately the lives of all of these beings are net, net positive or negative. Um, but I do know, um, that, uh, that's not going to sort itself out on its own. Um, so, uh, if, if, if we are worried, uh, that it might be negative, uh, on balance, uh, then, uh, I think that the only way we can, we can fix that and have a, a kind of positive natural world, um, lies in a kind of long and great future with humanity, um, doing something about that. Uh, as we grow more and more powerful and it requires a kind of smaller amount of our resources to do something about this, uh, we might be able to uh, um, uh, to actually make the natural world uh, better in this in this regard. Mm. My guess is that we're not going to continue to have farmed animals uh, for for that much longer as long as humanity continues because the, just the rate of progress in developing alternatives to, to animal agriculture is, is, is quite startling. Uh, it's, it's possible that it could be phased out in 100, 200 years. And, and then you're saying as well that uh, at some point in the future, humanity might have the technology to uh, make the wilderness better for wild animals uh, if, if, if we conclude that uh, it's actually very unpleasant for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's quite unclear how we would do that. And you could obviously you seriously mess it up if you did anything uh, short-sighted or misguided about it. Um, so, you know, humanity would want to be extremely careful. Um, but there may be ways of um, doing some minor genetic engineering, which means that they feel less pain, um, uh, you know, uh, in situations which would otherwise be very painful, um, or to to make it such that uh, um, there's there's less uh, just direct suffering from cold and and hunger and things like this. Um, but that is a 
grand project, uh, which is uh, uh, probably, you know, on the scale of interplanetary settlement or something like that. Um, you know, we're talking, uh, you know, so something that uh, that one might be able to do if you know if one if a civilization lives, you know it, it's been you know two thousand years, um, uh, you know since the uh, uh, birth of Christ and uh, um, and uh, you know less than that since uh, since the collapse of the Roman Empire and um, ultimately uh, you know who knows what we'll be doing in another 2000 years uh, let alone uh, if we can survive for another another million years and maybe we'll have the the abilities to to actually intervene and uh, and improve the lot of uh, of the natural world mm. what if you're not sure how good the future is going to be or you're not sure yet whether the future is uh, really important. What do you think someone who's kind of agnostic about these questions uh, ought to think and do? Well, that's, that's a good point. I mean, suppose, suppose that you're, you know, you've heard all of these different reasons for why the future might be very important that I listed, um, the well-being, the achievement, the partnership of the generations, uh, virtue, cosmic significance, and suppose you, you are skeptical of all of them. Um, well, uh, Will McCaskill, uh, has uh, has written a great piece about uh, imagining you're in that situation, uh, and it, there's still a very strong argument uh, that actually uh, existential risk um, is one of the the most pressing issues of our time, uh, and this comes from the idea of moral uncertainty and option value, uh, and the idea here is that uh, in the future we might be able to uh, you'll be able to get more information about uh, about how good these arguments are. You know, if they're a really bad argument, you might be able to see it be contradicted. Um, or if it's, it's a better argument than you thought, you might hear additional supporting reasons, which are very compelling. Um, and if we let the world be destroyed, uh, then we lose all of this option value. There's no coming back from that. Uh, but uh, if, we, uh, if we preserve it, um, then we may, you know, find out more information about uh, about the value of humanity, we may find that it's uh, particularly important. Uh, but we need to uh, uh, preserve humanity to be in these chances to really uh, lead to this great future. Mm. So I guess the the point is, if if we're all dead in a hundred years, then uh, even if it would turn out, even if it would turn out that we would have discovered that the long term future is incredibly morally important, uh, we'll, we'll never get to do that. On the other hand, if if we stick around, then you know we can still figure out whether it's really important or not, or, and, and decide in the future whether this is something that we want to prioritize. Uh, that's that's right, and, and it's it's particularly striking um, if you are entertaining the possibility that uh, that maybe uh, that humanity is ultimately net negative and that, that uh, either we cause destruction to everything else around us or that our lives are uh, worse than they are good. Um, uh, if, you, if you're entertaining a view like that, um, well, then uh, it was particularly important that we don't decide you know, to not have any more of human history, uh, but rather uh, we could always decide that later. Um, uh, once we've got more information, uh, but if we, if we get it wrong in the other direction, um, there's no coming back. Um, so then it becomes particularly stark, uh, that there's a, creates a very asymmetrical argument that, uh, it's very important to, uh, preserve humanity long enough to really sort out those arguments and only act, um, you know, to, to let humanity go extinct if, uh, we in the future had very strong, um, evidence for that, uh, which was compelling to, to everyone. We've discussed a few philosophical objections there. Let's maybe move on to more practical, uh, more practical issues that people raise about whether this really has any uh, meaningful implications. So many people might now think uh, there's enough arguments here that the long-term future is a really important issue that I'm convinced about that. But I'm not really sure that there's anything that I can do today that will make things better in hundreds or thousands of years. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a predictable way, other than just trying to improve uh, the present day in ways that people are already familiar with, like you know, improving education or improving people's health. Uh, what, what do you say to that? Do, are, are there ways of making the long term go better that, that are actually likely to succeed that are different from what people are already trying to do? Okay, uh, so there's a few key issues here uh, behind this question. I think it's a great question. Uh, so one of them uh, is uh, a distinction that, that Nick Beckstead has made uh, between uh, 
uh, what he calls broad and targeted interventions. Um, so a targeted intervention uh, to deal with existential risk uh, is one that, that takes perhaps a source of risk, uh, such as uh, nuclear weapons or a new technology such as artificial intelligence, um, and tries to directly work on that in order to um, uh, to target it in order to limit its, the risk that it produces. Um, but a broad intervention might be something uh, that just tries to improve um, say, the wisdom of civilization or our coordination um, or maybe uh, education or even um, uh, the economy um, and just tries to use these these very long-term kind of productive methods that societies used that have really helped us get where we are uh, now. Um, and it's not immediately obvious uh, which of those is the best approach, um, whether the targeted things are better than the broad things. Uh, I think that they are. Um, but I don't think it is, um, it's an obvious kind of open and shut case. Okay, that's the first bit. The second type of distinction I think is really important is this question about, if we're thinking about what can humanity do about this um, versus this question, what can I do about it? Now, I think it's pretty clear uh, that humanity can do a lot about this. In particular, the risks that I'm worried about are anthropogenic risks, so human-caused risks, um, such as uh, nuclear war. Um, and humanity itself can do a lot about nuclear war. We can just not have one, right? Um, so if we're imagining how could we collectively act, it's, it's pretty clear that we could act such that we don't have nuclear wars. Um, uh, there are some kind of group of humans who, if they controlled their actions, you know, they would just destroy all the nuclear weapons. Um, so I, I think that it's, it's more difficult, but I think it's also possible that if humanity got its act together um, with large numbers of people who really took this uh, seriously, uh, that we could also continue to develop new technologies, um, uh, you know, equivalent to developing um, atomic power and, and so forth. Uh, or, you know, so perhaps we could develop uh, synthetic biology and we could develop artificial intelligence uh, without incurring a very large amount of risk while doing so. We could take it slow and steady uh, and we could really um, devote a lot of our resources, not just to speeding up the process and making it all happen quickly, but to thinking through the implications, um, working out the kind of most, the key policy uh, approaches and also working out a lot of technical aspects about safety. Uh, so I think that's fairly clear that, you know, we could do something about human caused risk um, as humanity. Um, and I actually think that that's the main way that I'm going to be addressing it in the book um, in terms of tr saying that uh, safeguarding human civilization is a central issue of our time, uh, one of the key things that humanity needs to deal with. Um, but the way that you particularly asked the question was perhaps more like, but how could I as an individual do much about this? Um, and I do think that that, that is you know, it's, it's a bit harder to think about, um, but I'm not sure it's also the, the best framing to think about it in, um, because ultimately, uh, I think what you, you want to consider is what would the best portfolio of action look like, um, and then what role could I play in that? And I think that that helps to make it a bit easier to work out um, whether something's worth doing. Uh, so an example would be um, that maybe you think that if there was a big protest um, with 100,000 people marching in the street against a particular policy that's just been enacted and that's that's fairly unpopular and that you think there's a reasonable chance that you could get overturned, um, uh, you could think about would it be worth 100,000 people's time to march in the street to, to stop this thing um, rather than trying to think, well, what could I do if I change the number from N people to N plus one people? What's the chance that that additional one person is going to overturn this thing? Maybe it's incredibly small. Um, and so, and I think that trying to estimate those things just replaces a relatively sensible kind of problem with a, a very difficult to understand problem, um, which is much less intuitive. Um, and that sometimes within effective altruism, we go a little bit too far in terms of like, what difference would I make? Um, and it's where it becomes very intractable to measure, um, but where one can see that, you know, what the best portfolio of action is and kind of the role you could take in it. Yeah. Just if I could interrupt that, mm -hmm. it seems like it, it is, they're very similar questions and they should spit out very similar answers, but in mm -hmm. our minds, we treat them very differently. But it doesn't seem like it can be the case that it is worth 100,000 people showing up to the protest, but it's not worth any individual one of them to do it. 
that doesn't really yeah. make sense. That's a contradiction. So if it's worth it for the group to do it, then it has to be worth it for at least some of the individuals to do it. And I think that's one way yeah. of uh, resolving like these paradoxes that people end up in their mind where they're like, but it's it's not worth me showing up, but no one person can do it, but it is worth it to everyone. No, it's like if it's worth it for everyone, then it may well be worth it for you. Yes, uh, barring kind of somewhat unusual situations, like if we're all really sure that the other people are not going to turn up or something like that, then maybe we could all end up being rational not to turn up, but only in virtue of us having this silly belief about what everyone else thinks and so on. Um, so you can get certain kind of bizarre cases, but ultimately I think that uh, we do pretty well uh, just with this fairly common sense way of approaching it and thinking about um, largish groups of people. Um, in the case of uh, of uh, your listeners, sometimes that will be uh, the wider effective altruism movement and trying to think about what could we do not on the margins of an individual uh, life or an individual career, but what could we do on the margin of of the thousands of um, of, of careers um, that. Uh, that your listeners, you know, have and are thinking of doing. And I actually think a lot could be done with that. Um, but even if we just go with this question, it was harder to think about version where we're thinking about what could I do as an individual, you know, could I, you know, realistically make this massive difference? Could any individual do that? Um, I, so one certainly shouldn't think that it, the, the standard for, for deciding to work on something is that you will literally save the world and the whole of humanity <laughs> and that otherwise you're not going to do it right uh, that's that's a ridiculous standard to set uh, you know in terms of a high bar you know for getting off the sofa or something um so uh we should instead be thinking something like you know could i move the the needle on this uh in terms of the the chance of this happening um by you know even some very small amount um uh, and it's pretty clear that again not that many individuals can move the needle by say one part in a thousand um because then if more than a thousand people were trying to do that, there's nowhere else for the needle to go. Um, uh, so I ultimately, we're talking about, um, you know, if it's an individual, we're talking about some pretty small chances. Um, but at critical moments uh, in human history, um, individuals uh, have done this type of thing. Um, and we do have examples of this. So uh, one case is, um, is thinking about uh, Leo Zillard um, in the development of the, the atomic bomb. Um, he was a, a visionary uh, scientist who uh, thought, uh, you know, in the 1930s, he was thinking about this and he came up with the idea for the chain reaction that would lead um, to the fission bomb. Uh, and he, um, he, you know, he was 10 years ahead of his uh, time and he had years to think about what would happen with this. Um, he um, was an exile from, um, uh, from Europe uh, with the rise of fascism. Uh, and he was was immensely worried about uh, Hitler uh, getting the bomb, um, and he ended up uh, going over to America, working with the Americans uh, to uh, to build an atomic bomb. Uh, but also, he worked with the uh, the atomic uh, scientist community, uh, and he helped urge them uh, to secrecy. Um, this in some cases worked, in some cases it didn't. Um, sometimes the people he told to not publish their work on, um, on nuclear chain reactions published it anyway, um, leading to this work, um, being much more widely known, uh, and the Germans, uh, commencing a nuclear program. Uh, but in other cases, uh, he, uh, convinced, um, the American scientific establishment to classify, um, uh, all of their scientific research on these topics. Um, which helped to protect uh, secrets uh, such as the secret behind the plutonium bomb um, from being discovered elsewhere, um, which was very critical, uh, as that turned out to be the much easier bomb to, to create. Um, so uh, he's an example of an individual who, uh, you know, history like relates this episode in, in great detail, uh, and we can actually see the effects that he had. Um, there are other individuals that had um, large effect. Uh, uh, Niels Bohr uh, is another case, um, uh, and uh, he particularly, I mean, he didn't succeed in, in his main thing he was trying to do, which was to um, to try to convince uh, the leaders of uh, um, uh, basically Roosevelt and um, Churchill uh, to share the secrets deliberately. Uh, with the Soviet Union in order to avoid a Cold War. Um, he had uh, some good ideas behind this as to how to avoid a Cold War, um, and he foresaw a Cold War um, even years before the end of uh, 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 World War II. 
um, but he wasn't listened to on this. Um, but he had a very good shot at it, and we know exactly the details of all the meetings he had and so forth. Um, and he and a few other people uh, almost achieved uh, this, and uh, then that could have had dramatic effects after that. Uh, and then uh, another, you know, uh, example of a couple of people. Um, there's uh, 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 Stanislav uh, Petrov, um, who in the 1980s, in the autumn equinox incident, um, he was a, uh, a an officer in the Soviet army, and he was in charge of missile launch station, uh, and he witnessed uh, several uh, flashes of light uh, that looked like launches. Um, on his screen coming from America. Uh, but I think it was just a few, certainly it may have just been one. Um, and he was puzzled by this as to why, why they would launch so few missiles. And he thought it probably is a mistake of some sort. Um, uh, but his, uh, his orders were that if this happens, uh, then he needs to escalate to a uh, retaliatory strike on uh, America. Uh, and he decided not to escalate. Uh, and indeed it was just uh, sunlight in the kind of configuration that the Earth was in at the autumn equinox. It was uh, sunlight just uh, uh, reflecting off clouds um, at a certain altitude that looked like missile launches. Um, and so his decision of going against this protocol, um, it's not clear how far up, in how much further that would have escalated. Maybe someone else would have stopped it. But certainly a very small number of people um, uh, were in the position to stop this. Uh, and he was, he was there and he did. Um, and there are a whole lot of other uh, near-miss scenarios like this during the Cold War, uh, where we got very close um, to to a hot war. Um, uh, John F. Kennedy was involved in some of them. Uh, all of his uh, um, uh, his military council urged him to invade Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, it was unanimous. Uh, he was the only dissenter, and he said, no, we won't do it, um, and many other presidents would have. Um, and it turned out that uh, uh, that Castro had um, had asked uh, Khrushchev uh, to uh, to uh, initiate a nuclear strike um, using the missiles uh, in Cuba uh, on the mainland United States uh, if they were invaded. And it's not clear if Khrushchev would have followed through with that, um, but if he would have, uh, then that would have precipitated well, uh, uh, a major nuclear war. Another detail is actually that the field commanders, the Soviet field commanders in Cuba had independent launch authority, uh, I've, I've read, uh, which only came out quite recently that information was declassified. But it means that they independently of Khrushchev could have decided to start a nuclear war uh, if they were invaded. Well, that would have been uh, very bad. As, as, as I've said, um, uh, uh, Castro later has said that, that he would have done a nuclear retaliatory strike. Uh, and that moreover, uh, when he was asked uh, did he know what would have happened if he'd done that? Uh, he he replied, uh, it would have led to the complete annihilation of Cuba. Mm. Um, so, and he was still, um, you know, not only could have, but did order, um, you know, make this this kind of command to Khrushchev to mm. uh, to do this retaliatory strike. So uh, he, he was he was very committed to communism. <laughs> you can certainly give him that at least. He was a, he was a maniac, yeah. um, and. Uh, uh, there was also, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, Kennedy had de- his, and his council had decided that if a, if a U-2 spy plane were shot down, uh, one of their planes, that could only be done with Soviet um, uh, equipment uh, on in Cuba, uh, and so that if it was shot down, they would immediately invade, and they didn't need to reconvene the War Council. Um, the next night, it was shot down, um, and... Uh, Kennedy called to reconvene the War Council rather than <laughs> immediately invading. And there are a lot of these moments like this uh, during this this crisis. Uh, and another famous one was with um, uh, was with uh, Arkhipov, um, uh, Vasily Arkhipov, uh, who um, was a flotilla commander of a flotilla of nuclear submarines, which had been sent in by the Soviets to to take some nuclear materials into uh, into Cuba. Uh, they were deeply submerged. Uh, they didn't have radio contact with. Uh, uh, with the world, uh, and the um, the Americans started depth charging them, uh, and the Americans were using what they called practice depth charges, which are a kind of low yield depth charger, to try to just annoy them and force them to surface so that they could um, uh, be searched or something like that. Um, but the uh, the Soviets didn't know that; um, they thought they were real depth charges. Uh, and that they were under attack, and that uh, that uh, the Third World War had probably started at that point, since there was there was active hostilities against them. Uh, and the uh, submarine's commander uh, decided to launch their uh, tactical uh, nuclear weapon, which had about the uh, the yield of uh, the Hiroshima bomb. 
Uh, and uh, it, although it wouldn't have gone on the land, which would have been at least some kind of good news, it would have just destroyed a fleet. So maybe the, they wouldn't have led to a precipitated a nuclear war. Um, but he was trying to launch this uh, this nuclear torpedo. And uh, but on that particular submarine, because the flotilla commander was also there as well as the the submarines commander, um, he had the ability to override, and uh, that was Arkhipov, and he overrode uh, that order. Uh, so various stories like this have only just recently come out as the relevant people have either retired or died, um, and you know their memoirs have been released, um, and we're finding out a lot more about these very close near misses. There are all kinds of other cases where ac- you know live nuclear bombs were accidentally dropped out of um, out of bombers. Uh, in one case over the U.S. Um, by a U.S. bomber, in one case over Spain. Um, one of these bombs was never recovered. It just sunk into some marshland and they could never uh, excavate it. Um, uh, all kinds of crazy stuff happened uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of near misses. Um, so, uh, uh, and, you know, a lot of these are cases where just a few individuals were involved and made some really important decisions at the last moment. Mm. I imagine that some people listening will be thinking, sure, if you're a nuclear launch officer or you're the president of the United mm-hmm. States, yeah, and, and yes, in that case, you can have an effect on the probability of extinction. Uh, but I'm not one of those people and not likely to, to become one of those people. Uh, I suppose in this case, because we've been focused on the nuclear threat, which is the, the oldest extinction threat, um, mm-hmm. at least in the, in the modern era, um, mm-hmm. We were thinking a lot about, you know, the military and advanced scientific research and government and international diplomacy. Uh, should we expect it to be possible to predict what kinds of positions, what kind of people will be able to have an effect in future similar situations if there's other technologies like nuclear weapons that, that are developed? And can, can people realistically position themselves to be in the right place at the right time? Yeah, so good question. So the, the cases that history lets us judge um, as to... Um, as to the kind of clearest impact of, of individuals, are cases where they're at the last possible moment before a disaster. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that kind of causal consequences, you know, people only have causal consequences when they're at the final part of a chain. Um, it's just that those are the cases where we can clearly assess. Um, so there'll be a lot of people who are kind of earlier in these chains that kind of would have led to um, a disaster or not as well. Um, and one can, you know, go into positions, you know, uh, like that are perhaps more likely to happen. Um, but also, as you suggest, nuclear weapons are a kind of classified technology that's, uh, that's you know, a military thing. Um, but various other new technologies, which I think are going to be um, like the atomic energy of, of their century, um, which are, are things that are going to have, you know, very good aspects, but also uh, very big threats as well, um, include synthetic biology and also artificial intelligence. Uh, and these are technologies which are not classified um, and which people can actually uh, uh, work on uh, now and can can start engaging with. And I think that there are a whole lot of really important types of roles uh, related to that, uh, which people could very easily put themselves into positions uh, related to. I'll give you a few examples. Um, in, the, in the world of government and policymaking, uh, there are relatively few people who come from a science background. Um, uh, lots of people from a humanities or, um, or social sciences kind of background, very little in terms of uh, natural sciences. Uh, but people from those backgrounds um, need to actually come into that world um, and be the science interfacing people um, within policymaking uh, in order to, so that government, when it, when critical moments present themselves, um, has, you know, more scientifically literate policy uh, ability. Uh, and another example is on the, on the other side. Um, you need uh, people with a good understanding of, of ethics um, uh, and policy um, in science uh, and technology. Uh, so the people who are, say, working in synthetic biology, or if you imagine um, roles in, say, the leading... Um, scientific societies like the National Academy of Sciences or the, uh, the Royal Society, um, that you need people there who, um, uh, who have an eye to, um, to future generations and, and the ethics of these questions um, and can, can clearly write things and put them, put them out from the science perspective, uh, or people who are um, 
leading the professional societies of synthetic biology and artificial intelligence, uh, and also people who are working, um, you know, more closely with these technologies. Um, they can do good technical work on, um, on safety uh, regarding those technologies, uh, and they could also work on strategy uh, for how to safely manage these issues. Uh, so there's a whole lot of areas um, to do with both um, technical safety and strategy and uh, governance uh, and policy uh, connected to these new technologies. And since I think a lot of these threats are going to come from um, uh, radical new technologies that we invent, I think that there's a lot of uh, a lot of potential there. We've just been discussing what you would do if you wanted to position yourself to have a really large impact in the kind of in the situation that synthetic biology ends up being uh, being a really big deal. And you know we're at some kind of critical juncture in history. And you know that who invents synthetic biology or how it's applied or how it's regulated ends up being really essential. That there's there's other approaches that you could take, of course, which is to uh, try to just improve society in general, perhaps. Uh, one approach that has been suggested is to improve our ability to foresee future problems in general, and so we'll be able to to anticipate them. Do you want to describe uh, some of the more promising avenues that you see for improving the long term there? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I think that there's a lot of different issues here. So, so here are a few more. Um, uh, one can work on. Uh, um, uh, research. Uh, so research could include, uh, as as we've just said, really on work on particular risks. Um, there's also a lot of really good research that could happen um, on these general questions about existential risk in the long term future. Um, the type of research that I do uh, and that, that that's going into my book. Um, and I then there's uh, also work uh, that could be done on uh, addressing risk factors. Um, so this is an idea. I have where um, if we think about particular risks, um, such as uh, the risk um, of uh, synthetic biology, um, it's a technology that might be able to uh, destroy uh, humanity or humanity's potential. Um, and we could assign some some probability to that. We could say, I don't know, you know maybe it has a 1% um, uh, chance that it would do that this century. Um, but there are other things that aren't themselves risks, uh, existential risks, but which might increase existential risk by a certain amount. So take, for example, great power war. Um, so that is war between uh, great powers such as um, the USA and, um, and Russia or the USA and China. Um, uh, such a war uh, may not in itself be a risk um, in that there's no no direct way in which it's not just because they had a war that we went extinct, um, but it may increase the amount of risk overall. Um, and uh, in fact, you can you can think about this in terms of what would the risk of human extinction over the century be conditional upon um, there uh, being a great power war uh, compared to if we didn't condition upon that. Uh, and my guess is that uh, if there is great power war this century, then the you know the chance of getting through the century intact um, goes down by you know a percentage point or more compared to if there isn't. Um, uh, in which case, uh, great power war itself um, might kind of instrumentally create more risk than the particular issue of synthetic biology has. Um, that's just an example, and those numbers are, are made up. Um, but it's actually plausible that some of these risk factors, these things that exacerbate risk, um, could themselves be be larger than various particular risks. Um, great power war this century is definitely a larger factor than um, asteroid risk, which we know is is you know point oh 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 one percent per century or something like that. Um, uh, and so. There's, that gives you a whole lot of additional levers and things to work on, um, such as working on peace, um, international cooperation, and things like that. Um, and one could also work um, on this idea of uh, uh, fostering these civilizational virtues of, uh, of uh, increased prudence and patience and wisdom for civilization. And maybe that sounds a lot like um, this kind of broad approach of uh, – doing the types of general um, service for the world that you might have thought were fairly natural, even if you hadn't considered uh, existential risk. Are there some approaches that you think are just obviously too broad? Good question. Um, I think uh, working, just saying 
okay, what about science, improving science? Uh, my guess is that because that begets technology, which begets some of the risk, uh, it's unlikely that just pushing on that um, is is a plausible thing uh, to particularly help. Uh, I mean, I, I while I really like this distinction between narrow uh, or targeted approaches compared to these broad, really broad approaches, uh, my guess is that targeted ones are often often better, but they don't need to be targeted directly at the technology that might destroy us. Uh, they might be able to be um, targeted at some other mechanism which is important to getting through all of this. Um, uh, but again, this is really early days on this, and in fact, coming up with some really strong arguments um, uh, one way or the other on that uh, would be very helpful. Um, it, it's, it's actually sometimes pointed out, and I think it's a really interesting kind of argument, that, that what about if this was uh, 200 years ago or, or 300 years ago? Um, what would someone who cared about these issues be working on back then? Um, they uh, actually probably wouldn't even know about asteroid risk um, or supervolcano risk or various other natural risks. Um, well, actually, they might know a little bit about it. Um, uh, and then these anthropogenic risks hadn't even been created. And it seems pretty plausible that actually broad approaches there, um, you know, continuing with the Enlightenment um, was one of the best things that they could could have done to actually put us into a good position for a long-term future. Um, although uh, I actually think that um, stockpiling food uh, <laughs> probably would have been a key thing to do back then um, as a very generic um, kind of protection against things. And as it, it, you know, you wouldn't have had to have, it wouldn't be a total kind of impossible thing to guess that, um, if you're worried about the end of human civilization, that maybe stockpiling food could help. Uh, and it turns out that it would have helped quite a bit with asteroid impact. Mm. Um, and so, uh, so maybe even back then, uh, uh, some targeted things, uh, could have been helpful. Um, but I, I do agree with the general point that uh, that very broad things also were, were very helpful back then. Mm. I suppose there's, uh, there's also the somewhat broad approach of just promoting the kind of views that you're promoting now. Uh, someone 200 years ago could have said, it's very important that we preserve the long term. We should think more about how we can do this and make sure that future generations are concerned about this. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And uh, and that that is also, you know, fairly natural in in. in uh, things that people did work on. There were various moral philosophers who tried to um, to work out what were the most important issues facing uh, facing humans who were thinking about them, um, and uh, and then promulgating uh, these ideas uh, to shape you know how future generations would would make ethical decisions. That was that was something that was done uh, by various people, um, and. Uh, that therefore, if they'd realised that uh, preserving human civilization was one of these things, uh, then they could have, uh, you know, tried to incorporate that, mm. um, and it, and it probably would have worked. It would have helped mean that common sense morality was already kind of much more focused on this uh, than it is, um, and maybe, as you mentioned, may, uh, maybe the uh, approach of the Australian Aboriginal people was. Uh, was in that vein in terms of really thinking about the long term. Mm. We've talked a lot about reducing risks to the future. What about thinking about uh, the opposite of that, uh, which is extremely large upsides? Uh, are there any practical ways that people might go about not so much preventing a really you know extinction or something horrible, but also trying to create something that's much more positive than what we have reason to hope for? I'm not sure. Um in some some level, we had something like this happen in terms of if you tracked the expected value of the future um, uh, in the past, uh, that uh, once we found out um, how long the world had been around and how long it was expected to be around for in the future, um, the scope of humanity might have increased by a huge amount. Um, similarly, when people discovered that these tiny little dots that moved around in the sky, uh, the, the planets, uh, were other worlds, like other Earths, um, uh, the, the scope might have increased quite a lot. And particularly when they found out that these, uh, these myriad uh, points of light, uh, the stars, uh, were other suns, uh, which might contain their own planets, um, you know, the scope uh, at that point increased you know, by the factor of 100 billion um, with that discovery. Um, so there are at least um, cases where 
the expected value of the future went up by a lot. Uh, but that was more just by realizing that there was much more, perhaps, that, that we could achieve um, rather than really working out some opportunity that perhaps, you know, is only here once and that we could grab. Um, and in order to be – the key behind these ideas of existential risk as opposed to just any old way of trying to help with the long term uh, is this idea of this really high leverage um, because it's something that is – an irrevocable loss if it happens, um, such that avoiding it is a opportunity that you only get this once um, to create a huge amount of benefit. Uh, and so uh, in order to have this existential hope scenarios, it wouldn't be enough that there was some really clever thing we could do, um, say to rearrange our society or, or, you know, uh, or something in some way that's much better. It would have to be the case that if we didn't do it now, then there was no other opportunity to get it. Uh, in order to really be the the reverse, um, so I'm not sure of things like that, but uh, but very little thought has gone into this, and uh, um, you know maybe if if people thought about it for you know <laughs> more than an hour, <laughs> perhaps more perhaps more than a year, uh, they will find something there, or you know at least the hints of something, and might be able to make some progress. Mm. Another practical objection that people sometimes raise is that. Of course, because you and I don't want to die anytime soon and countries don't want to disappear off the face of the earth, they already have a pretty reasonable incentive to try to reduce the risk of a catastrophic disaster. And so it's not a neglected problem. It's It, it might be a problem, but it's something that we're already dealing with as, as well as we can. What, what do you think of that? I mean, I, I think that that generally is a very good way of reasoning and uh, and it's a very useful sanity check, particularly if someone comes up to you and says, hey, here's this area that may be actually one of the central issues of our time um, and yet is neglected. Um, you should question that and say, well, why would it have been so neglected? Um, uh, but it's this is a case where we have some pretty good answers to this. Um, so one thing is that uh, take a very large and powerful country like the United States of America. Um, the U.S. only has 5% of the world's population within its borders, a little bit less. Um, and uh, so if you think about uh, these risks, uh, actually they're only internalizing about 5% of the damages um, in terms of the world's population. So we'd be expecting them to underweight it um, by about a factor of 20 um, but it gets even worse when you consider that actually uh, most of the, the the terribleness that I've been talking about um, comes from not having the entire future of humanity, um, whether that be hundreds or thousands of additional generations or more, um, or via the great achievements that they'll produce. Um, and so this is called a, um, a global public good. Uh, and in particular, an intergenerational global public good. Uh, and it's the type of exact type of thing that we'd expect to be have a market failure and to be under-prioritized by uh, individual nation states. Um, and uh, the, the UN on the whole, maybe um, the uh, uh, might be in a position <laughs> to do this, but it's you know not all that smoothly functioning and it's very difficult to get all the different um, heads of state around the table to, uh, to agree on things. Um, and it's, you know, it's very slow to, to act. Uh, so I think you can actually, you know, challenge this efficient market idea quite successfully here and, and debunk it and show why this could still be, be happening. And then on, on top of that, I should say that, uh, I've talked to government about these things, um, to, to many people, um, in the British government, and they have all basically said the same thing to me, which is, wow, this sounds like really serious stuff. And, I would love to be able to spend more time thinking about it and to be able to, you know, they were, they were really serious about this. They, you know, it was clearly the most interesting meeting that they'd had all week, uh, but that they didn't have the time to think about it. Um, they had to go back to dealing with the, the kind of fires that need to be put out and uh, the, um, the burning issues, you know, where the minister is, uh, you know, really needs a report on their desk, you know, by next Wednesday. Uh, and, they don't have the time to deal with these things. Even people dealing with, uh, you know, what are meant to be the the biggest issues of risk of facing the whole government. Um, so, uh, from what I've seen, these are, are not issues uh, that um, that are able to get that much attention in a very kind of short news cycle political process. Uh, another objection that people raise is just a very high level of skepticism that. There are that, that the catastrophic risks are, are likely to occur. 
So perhaps that, that sounds a bit surprising given the, the cases you've mentioned where it seemed like we were very close to, to having an all-out nuclear war that presumably would have put us uh, at some risk. But are there any other points that you want to make to people who think, nah, things are fine, things are secure, uh, w- w- humanity will continue on more or less no matter what? So I think that that some of this is is not you know is somewhat reasonable empirical belief to have. Um, while I think that if you're familiar with the evidence on the near misses with the with the Cold War, you should think that there's a a realistic chance that that could have um, turned into an all out nuclear war, um, maybe of the order of ten percent or higher. Um, uh, however, I. Uh, it's not clear um, at all that an all-out nuclear war would have led to our extinction. Um, the early work on nuclear winter suggested that it would was it was really quite likely that it would be very severe. Um, but more recent analysis suggests that while it would be very severe and it would be clearly a global catastrophe um, of, of unprecedented proportion, uh, it would be unlikely to cause the actual extinction of humanity. So uh, the main way that that could happen is if the models that are currently being used just aren't the right models, um, which is itself uh, fairly plausible that, you know, we don't, you know, we've, this has been an unprecedented situation. We can't kind of demand that we have um, so many examples of like, you know, massive global nuclear wars to get our p-values, you know, <laughs> down to 0.05 about exactly what's going to happen. Come on, scientists, run, run the experiment. <laughs> so we have to decide this um, uh, in this position of uncertainty. Um, but, you know, it, wouldn't be unreasonable to think that that maybe you know it's just very hard to actually even with an all out nuclear war to actually cause human extinction even with all of the massive global cooling and things that would happen and i think that that that's somewhat plausible so um so you know it's it's unknown um and then they might think well maybe that's going to be true for the, the the new technologies as we as we're gaining power um at this accelerating rate um it starts to get less plausible, you know, with the technologies we're having this century and then the ones we'll have the century after and so on, um, uh, that unless we're you know, likely to run out of radical new technology soon and just invented all the ones that will ever be invented or something, it does look like this process is going to produce some pretty large risk. That, that's, that's what I think. Uh, and I would put the risk for this century at something like one in six, uh, like Russian roulette. Um, uh, but... But uh, if someone said, no, I think it's much lower, um, uh, then here's the following kind of idea. Um, when you're thinking about uh, the value of the, the future of humanity, um, there's actually this interesting tension between a couple of things. Uh, one is that whether there's enough risk to actually reduce, and uh, the other is how long the future will be. Um, and so if people think that um, it's almost impossible uh, to destroy humanity. Maybe they think that the risk per century um, is something like one in a million. Um, then they also seem to be somewhat committed to thinking that we're going to get about a million centuries um, uh, if we survive this century, um, because that's what uh, what it looks like if you have a constant hazard rate of one in a million per century. That's the expectation. Uh, in which case, uh, the, the am- amount of value if we avoid extinction goes up kind of proportionately. Uh, such that even though there's only a very small amount of risk, if we could avoid that risk, um, it would actually uh, have a similar value, um, avoiding the one in a million chance of uh, of risk compared to if it was a one percent chance. In which case, there'd be fewer expected centuries. Uh, now, it doesn't. The math doesn't work out as cleanly with with more realistic models, uh, but those more realistic models actually suggest the future is even more important than this. Um, uh, but it is interesting if you actually play around with these numbers and try to work it out um, that people who are, who think that there's very little risk really are kind of committed to there being a very long future as well, um, uh, unless they hold a very kind of elaborate series of beliefs about there's very little risk now, but there'll be a lot of risk later, and that risk later will be impossible to do anything about now, and some things like that. They, you know, it really has to start to get like and such that you would say, well, you previously sound like a skeptic. Now you sound like someone who has a lot of very precise beliefs about the distant future and what's going to happen then. Um, uh, so it is actually tricky to get this to work out, trickier than you might think. And uh, on some of the, the most sensible models of looking at this, actually the smaller the amount of risk there is, uh, it becomes even more important, actually, um, uh, to, to eliminate it 
than if it was a larger amount of starting risk, mm. um, somewhat surprisingly. I guess unless you adopt one of the views that we discussed earlier uh, about how you're not, not convinced by any of these arguments that the long-term future uh, has a lot of value. You've, you've, just, you've, you've also you know, chosen a whole lot of philosophical positions, perhaps like somewhat sort of contradicting ones uh, that, uh, that give you an idea that, oh, well, only the present generation matters. Yeah, if, if, you're, um, if you're that impatient <laughs> and, um, uh, and kind of near-termist uh, to think that, that it's completely irrelevant what happens after this point, you would normally be a bit of a pariah for holding beliefs like that. <laughs> Um, like pe- people who uh, who say we shouldn't do anything about climate change, um, you know, appeal to uh, the um, empirical, you know, questions about it. <coughs> uh, they uh, would look very bad if they said, "Oh no, it's going to destroy the lives of a whole lot of people in the future." But that just doesn't matter at all, or something like that. Yeah, you might might not invite them to your next party. No. Um, so at least it's, it's not publicly acceptable to hold views like that, but uh, that doesn't immediately say that they they're, don't work. But I, I, I'm, I start to get pretty sceptical. Mm. We've been a little bit vague about exactly which kind of existential risks we're concerned about or exactly you know, w- which ones we think are, are most likely to, to put an end to, to human civilization. Do you want to just kind of give your, give your ranked list of the things that you're most troubled by? Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, so of, as a specific uh, uh, technology uh, or threat, I'm particularly troubled by artificial intelligence. I think that it's an extremely powerful technology. Uh, it's very likely to be the most powerful technology of our century. Um, but it also potentially comes with very big downside as well. I think uh, Nick Bostrom has detailed this very well in his book, Super Intelligence, for anyone who's interested. Uh, and uh, I'm very worried uh, about that technology. I think that we will get through it and that we'll manage it successfully. Um, but, uh, and that's why I'm devoting quite a lot of my time to trying to do that, just that. Uh, but that is something that keeps me awake at night. Um, I'm also worried, uh, about synthetic biology. Um, although to a, a slightly smaller degree, um, as another extremely powerful technology, uh, that has the potential, uh, to either, um, accidentally or deliberately, um, cause massive destruction of the ecosystem or potentially have engineered viruses, um, uh, which could potentially cause our extinction. Um, and then, uh, when thinking about this, it's, it's clear that at, at most time periods, if you've been trying to predict what would be the big sources of risk, uh, you wouldn't have been able to get it right. Um, and ultimately thinking about some category of unknown unknowns, um, would be where most of the risk was. It was in things that you didn't even know what to what to call them, like synthetic biology or or um, artificial intelligence. And I think that that's uh, quite likely to still be the case. That most of the future threats uh, will be things that we haven't yet uh, contemplated. Uh, however, I also think that uh, when it comes to our strategy for the future, what we really need to do is to move to a a safe position. Uh, to go uh, as quickly as we can while incurring as little risk as we can um, to get humanity to a position where we're taking these things seriously and we can then move forward very slowly and steadily um, and incur very little risk from that point onwards. And I think that actually uh, it's not easy, but I think that we can get to a point uh, this century where we're doing that. And if so, uh, then maybe the... Uh, overall risk from the unknown unknowns would actually be smaller than some of these other things because they would strike at a point after we'd already got to act together um, instead of some of these technologies which are coming up um, very soon uh, where we clearly do not have our act together uh, as we face them. When you describe this safe position, some people, I guess, are trying to create that by colonising Mars. So you kind of have a backup of humanity that could recolonise Earth if things went uh, really badly here. But I, I imagine you're thinking more about a world in which we're extremely patient and prudent and we're simply not going to take risks as a species. That's right. I, I think that the idea of colonizing other planets is often put forward um, as a solution to this, and I, I think that that's actually a mistake. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, spreading beyond Earth uh, in the, the long-term future, and I think that a lot of humanity's destiny is ultimately uh, in the heavens above us. Uh, but 
I don't see it particularly as a good solution to these risks. Uh, and that's for two different reasons. Um, I think in the short term, it's not a great, um, it's not a very cost effective way of reducing risk. If you look at the benefits you get from having a um, colony of people living uh, on Mars and how long it would take, uh, then it compares quite unfavorably to creating a similar kind of refuge um, somewhere in a desert uh, on Earth, um, you know, with shielded atmosphere and, and so forth. Um, perhaps with, uh, with people who go into a kind of bunker, um, you know, for two years at a time and overlapping by a year with the, you know, in another bunker such that there's at any point, there's people who have been under there for, you know, in, protected for more than a year so that circulating viruses, you know, uh, will have been discovered before they, um, you know, uh, before it could infect them and so on and so forth. I think that there's a whole lot of very clever things you could do with much less expense, uh, on earth ultimately. And then in the very long term. I think that um, having multiple planets uh, helps uh, a lot with all of the uncorrelated types of risks. Um, so things that could go wrong, uh, you know, on one planet um, mean that you could always uh, repopulate that planet or something uh, with the other people who are elsewhere, uh, unless they all went wrong simultaneously, which becomes extremely unlikely as you increase the number of locations that people are. Um, so uncorrelated risks would basically go away, uh, but there's still a lot of correlated risks, um, such as um, a terrible ideology or some kind of uh, war with catastrophic weapons um, would be the type of thing that may affect all of the locations, uh, you know, uh, with the same causal mechanism. And so merely having a galaxy of, of worlds um, wouldn't offer all that much protection from these things. Uh, and what you really need to have the protection is to have a sufficiently unified civilization um, that it's never going to go war at war with itself. Um, or something like that. And I think that ultimately to really get these risks uh, down um, very close to zero, where they have to be in order to survive for, for very long periods of time, uh, it requires this kind of coordination. Um, so in the, in the short term, you could imagine trying to achieve this. Um, if it was the case that, um, that uh, pe you know, people, perhaps some young dedicated people who really take these ideas seriously, uh, found their way into government um, uh, perhaps became uh, diplomats or ambassadors or uh, other forms of decision makers um, who could help to uh, uh, to shape international policy on this. Um, then, uh, then you, if you imagine a world where, uh, say, several of the Security Council member countries all have uh, governments that take this very seriously, uh, then you know we may be a long a long way along the the path to to stability, uh, and it may also be. Uh, we tend to forget this, uh, that there, there are periods like now where it's very difficult to have innovation in global institutions. Um, you can't just create a new UN or, or big body like that. But there are other times, like just after the end of World War II, where there was a massive appetite um, for creating new global institutions and a lot more things could happen. Uh, and if we enter another period like that, we want to have a lot of people who are very well placed um, to be able to take you know, these ideas about how to protect the world and, uh, um, and use them uh, you know, to, to build new uh, protective institutions that help us do global coordination in order to avoid these threats. So over the last few hours, uh, on, on the one hand, we've talked about how wonderful the future might be with better technology, how much better life could be and, and how long uh, things might go on. But on the other hand, you've also said that you think there's something like a one in six chance that human civilization won't make it through the next hundred years. Do you see the glasses as half full or, or half empty? Ultimately, uh, I'm much more on the the half full side. Um, the the reason uh, that it's that it's particularly alarming uh, that we might not make it through um, is because we have such a great and glorious future uh, at stake. Uh, I think that that uh, uh, it's likely, uh, more likely than not, uh, that we'll make it through uh, this this very difficult period that we're in at the moment with these anthropogenic existential risks uh, and that we'll make it through, we'll reach uh, a safe position, we'll be able to have this very long reflection where we can work out what our um, considered moral views are about the future and be able to act on them and produce um, a much better world. Uh, and that uh, probably we will uh, we will see us uh, spread beyond the earth and uh, and uh, bring life uh, to the lifeless uh, worlds around us. 
uh, and that this will probably be uh, be a tremendous thing and possibly the uh, the most you know with no exaggeration uh, the most amazing thing uh, in our universe um, and that's why I think it's so important to uh, to fight for this having this chance uh, and to not let down uh, all of the uh, the generations that came before us and help to to pass on this flame from generation to generation uh, and to really try to bring it about that we have this great and glorious future. My guest today has been uh, Toby Ord. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Toby. Thank you very much. I hope that you enjoy listening to that episode. This is just a reminder that if you feel interested in potentially using your career to tackle some of the risks to the future of humanity that we talked about, then you should completely apply for coaching from 80,000 Hours Coaches to help you uh, with doing that. And you can find the link to apply for coaching either in the blog post about this episode or in the show notes attached to it. Also, if you enjoyed this episode and you're not yet subscribed, uh, search for 80,000 Hours in whatever app you use to listen to podcasts and you'll find us and can subscribe and get notified about our future episodes so that you don't miss any of them. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week.